Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's live broadcast on Solaris, a novel open-air fluorescence imaging system for image-guided surgery applications. I am Brenda Kelly Kim of LabRoot, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's webcast is presented by LabRoot.com, the leading social media site for science professionals and sponsored by Perkin Elmer, the leader in innovative imaging, detection, and informatics solutions. Before we start, I just want to show you a couple of features to ensure you get the most out of this webinar. We want to hear from you during this interactive broadcast, so please ask questions or leave us a comment. Answers welcome, too. You can do this by hitting the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window and typing in your comments and questions. We'll try to get to as many as we can, and we'll follow up if we don't have time today. Want a better look? You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the screen icon in the lower right-hand corner of the slide window. If you can't hear or see this presentation properly, please let us know by clicking on the support button on the top right or use the Q&A button. We'll make sure we try to resolve any issues. Now let's get right to today's presenters. We are proud to welcome Dr. Yael Yared, R&D leader in life science technologies at Perkin Elmer, and Dr. Jeffrey Peterson, director of applied biology at Perkin Elmer. Dr. Yared leads all research and product development activities for Perkin Elmer's Life Science Technologies Division and is the founding director of the company's new Center for Personalized Health Innovation in the Boston area. Dr. Yared also leads the company's clinical translation programs for in vivo diagnostics in collaboration with strategic partners. Prior to joining Perkin Elmer, Dr. Yared was Chief Technology Officer for Vizen Medical, where he led the development of fluorescence molecular tomography and Vizen's molecular agent portfolio. He holds a PhD in engineering from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Dr. Peterson received, received his PhD in immunology and neuroscience from Northwestern University, where his research was focused on autoimmune diseases, including multiple sclerosis and type 1 diabetes. After finishing his degree, Dr. Peterson worked as a scientist at Boehringer, Ingelheim, and Abbott BioResearch, where he led development of novel drugs, therapies, and biomarkers. Dr. Peterson has been leading research efforts in fluorescence, imaging, for the past nine years at Vizen Medical, and then Perkin Elmer, developing novel imaging agents and applications in preclinical research models. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you to our webinar on the Solaris Imaging Platform. This is Wael Yared. I will give you a description of the Solaris Imaging System, technology, hardware, and software, uh, highlighting a few key performance attributes of the technology. And then we'll hand it over to my colleague, Dr. Jeffrey Peterson, who will provide a few illustrative applications in in vivo imaging situations. Let me begin uh, by describing Perkin Elmer's uh, in vivo imaging, preclinical imaging portfolio, which is a broad and rich portfolio of instrument platforms that go all the way from anatomical imaging, for example, with the Quantum GX, which provides fast, low dose, high throughput resolution computed tomography readouts to uh, functional and metabolic platforms and, uh, for example, the, uh, the PET X-ray and PET CT platforms that we have partnered with Sophie Biosystems to develop and uh, commercialize, all the way to our optical molecular imaging platforms exemplified by the IVIS Lumina, the IVIS Spectrum, and FMT uh, uh, instruments. What these platforms share in common is that they're all designed for small animals, and that's the mainstay of uh, preclinical imaging in both drug development and research. And of course, what the small animal imaging anatomy introduces is the possibility of a closed imaging chamber, which provides the instrument and the instrument user with the benefits of a fully controlled optical environment. In contrast with this, uh, large animal imaging is, uh, is uh, not able to benefit from having this imaging chamber. And to remedy this gap, we developed the Solaris imaging instrument. And that's what I'd like to talk about today. 
So Solaris is a large animal and translational imaging platform. By virtue of the anatomy of the animal that it's imaging, it needs to operate in an open air ambient environment with ambient lighting. Um, and like the rest of our preclinical imaging portfolio, Solaris comes complete with a portfolio of in vivo fluorescence molecular agents, which we'll uh, talk about later on in the presentation. And of course, it comes with a robust set of applications drawing on the deep expertise we've uh, uh, developed over the years at Perkin Elmer. This is a research use only platform. It's a key performance attribute is that it does real time imaging at fluorescence as well as white light and overlays the two. It can do this at video frame rates or high sensitivity snapshot imaging. Its ability to reject ambient light is, uh, uh, is based on the surgical grade luminaires that are designed in the instrument. It, is, uh, it covers a number of um, excitation channels. It has broad spectral coverage, which we'll uh, detail in a minute, and provides both hardware and algorithmic controls of lighting in order to reject uh, ambient light. Uh, and all of this is resting on a foundation of Perkin Elmer's expertise in preclinical imaging, our expertise in molecular imaging and image analysis, and our uh, depth and breadth of uh, engineering expertise in instrument design, software, and, and imaging agents. And we currently have a number of instruments in, um, in, uh, in current use. Um, before we dive into the technology itself, I just wanted to give you a very quick thumbnail description of some of the key applications we envision for Solaris, which, were, which my colleague will, will then take in much more detail in a few minutes. Uh, but broadly speaking, Solaris is an instrument which is really designed to provide pre-surgical guidance, surgical guidance, for example, delineation of tumor margins and examination of residual disease, as well as post-surgical guidance, for example, examination of the surgical cavity and providing guidance to pathologists. It has applications spanning a number of major disease areas, for example, oncology, atherosclerosis, inflammatory processes and arthritis, vaccine development, and generic safety and pharmacology assessment. And in all these cases, uh, the signal is mediated by a uh, molecular agent which is targeted to a certain biology. Uh, so different imaging biomarkers, for example, include integrins, uh, proteases such as MMPs or cathepsins, uh, or other uh, cell surface receptors. And these are typically targeted by the portfolio of agents, which we will illustrate later on. So what are the features of Solaris as an instrument? First and foremost, I would say it is very easy to use. Both the hardware and the software were designed to operate in a very busy surgical suite, and therefore they support a truly uh, a, a true surgical workflow. So the instrument is operated by a tablet, has a very simple touchscreen interface. The workflow makes it easy to acquire snapshots or real-time videos. The instrument has two large uh, medical grade monitors for enhanced resolution and color fidelity and provides easy one-handed adjustment of the imaging head with autofocus uh, when needed. The second key feature of the instrument is that it provides surgical grade illumination in both white light and fluorescence. And the broad spectral coverage facilitates preclinical and translational use. And that spectral coverage includes uh, a short visible channel at 470 nanometers of excitation, a couple of red and in near infrared channels at 660 nanometers and 750 nanometers of excitation, and a slightly deeper near infrared channel at 800 nanometer excitation. And those four channels support a broad range of dyes and agents, going from fluorescine on the, on the short end of the spectrum all the way to endosamine green or ICG on the long end of the spectrum. And then finally, another unique feature of the instrument hardware and software is its ability to acquire multispectral images and do image deconvolution in order to attenuate autofluorescence where autofluorescence is a problem, namely in the short visible band on the 470 nanometer channel. And this is done using our proprietary liquid crystal tunable filter technology. 
So looking a little bit more closely at the design of the, of the optical head, the optical head provides all of the optics, electronics, and mechanical components that are used for illumination and imaging. And starting with illumination, we provide a number of illumination modules in both white light and fluorescence via distributed high-power LED sub-assemblies, uh, specifically 10 of these modules for each head. And within each of these modules, we have two high-brightness white light LEDs and four excitation LEDs corresponding to the four channels. This arrangement was designed in order to maximize uniformity of illumination, provide good control, control of shadows, and good management of the thermal load. Um, the fluorescence detector itself is a high-grade SCMOS camera that can run at very high frame rates with fine pixel resolution and low levels of noise. And likewise, uh, we use a high-performance CMOS detector for the white light or color band in overlay. So what were some of the considerations that went into the design of the illuminator? We wanted to make sure that we provided very good illumination uniformity across all of the spectral bands, and that's why we distributed the illuminators in the pattern that you see here. We also wanted to minimize shadows projected onto the surgical cavity from both external and internal sources. External sources such as a surgical tool is an example, and internal sources such as protruding or, or uh, deep cavities within the surgical bed itself. And uh, you'll see some examples of those on the next slide. We also wanted to, of course, reject ambient light, which we do via both spectral and temporal means, and dissipate heat properly. And so as an example of how we've been able to meet these uh, design objectives, what you see here is a, um, is a measurement and, and result of the illuminated performance from the, um, from the uniformity perspective. So we achieve white light brightness that is equivalent to surgical luminaires. We illuminate a field of view of 20 by 20 centimeters, which is double the size of the imaging field of view of 10 by 10 centimeters. And we provide lower than 10% variation of illumination over the entire imaging field of view which gives the user the assurance that the signal they're getting is, is corresponding accurately to the floor for concentration in the tissue rather than to hot spots in the, uh, in the lighting itself. We've also optimized the control of shadows via this multiple angle illumination on the working surface and inside the surgical channels. And a couple of diagrams you see on the lower right-hand side of the slide give you a uh, measurement of these shadows under various conditions. Likewise, moving from the white light illumination to the fluorescence illumination, we provide fluorescence excitation optics to cover this broad band going from the uh, short visible at 470 all the way to 800 nanometers. We provide both temporal and spectral gating schemes for the excitation and illumination LEDs to reject ambient lighting. The, the diagram on the top left side shows you the uh, spectral gating uh, and shows you the most popular excitation and emission dye spectra corresponding to the various channels. And the uh, series of photographs underneath to show you the effect of the temporal gating uh, process we, we, we follow to subtract ambient light from the background and result in a, a very specific signal in the foreground. Um, we also, as I mentioned, provide a three-stage liquid crystal tunable filter to handle autofluorescence in the visible range. This uh, cell sweeps across a number of uh, wavelengths in that channel, acquires the images, and then subtracts automatically the uh, autofluorescence of tissue in that band from the contribution of the fluorophore. All of this is encapsulated in an optical head. The head is mounted on a, an articulated arm that provides three degrees of freedom for adjustment in yaw, pitch, and roll with a broad range of motion that makes it easy to move the head, adjust the head, 
on the subject regardless of the orientation of the subject. There is gross positioning as well as fine positioning, and of course, autofocus is provided within that instrument as well. And the handles are fully compatible with sterile wraps so that they can, uh, so that the optical head can be comfortably mounted above the surgical bed. Say a few things about the software. Again, the, the key design objective here is a simple and streamlined workflow-oriented interface. The software is based on an event-sourced architecture, which will be supportive of GLP and 21 CFR Part 11 compliance. And it is based on a distributed architecture, which itself will enable a robust fault tolerance and recovery, as well as deployment across multiple machines and cloud-based sharing and data management. What you see in the screenshot of the software is a simple top-level user interface with the imaging viewports. Uh, two of them, as a matter of fact, the one on the left happens to show an overlay of fluorescence with white light. The one on the right shows just the white light image, and various permutations can be applied by the end user. In terms of operating the instrument via the tablet, it's a very simple user interface again that begins left to right from setting up an imaging session, then selecting an imaging channel, whether it's 470, 660, 750, or 800, selecting a field of view, and then simply starting to image. And when you start to image, you have the ability to acquire snapshots, record videos, pause and resume imaging at any point in time, as you're imaging, zooming in, zooming out, and rotating the images in order to maximize the facility of imaging in a complex, in a complex and cluttered surgical environment. Once imaging has been acquired, the data can be managed quite readily, both videos and snapshots, via a simple user interface and data hierarchy that is um, well suited for research environments with a hierarchy of studies, subjects, and sessions. Uh, that allow you to retrieve and manipulate and analyze all of the data. And you'll see some examples of those analyses uh, later on in the presentation. To give you a sense of the imaging performance of this instrument, we've characterized it across a number of key dimensions. First and foremost, of course, is the resolution of imaging. And we've uh, designed uh, high-quality optics into the instrument, so we have a fine resolution that is enabled by diffraction-limited optics. We currently resolve 100 microns at the full 10 centimeters field of view, uh, which was our original target, and we've actually exceeded that target quite substantially. Uh, but this allows us to image supercellular aggregates in a in a surgical uh, patient, in, a, in an animal that is fully intact and breathing. A second key spec for such a platform is its sensitivity under ambient illumination, and that is a very important requirement. And so we set out to uh, hit a certain uh, sensitivity spec. We've actually managed to exceed that spec, and we currently are able to detect uh, lower than 10 nanomolar of fluorophore concentration across all of the channels in snapshot mode under full ambient illumination and we're able to detect fewer than 50 nanomolar of fluorophore concentration across all channels at full video frame rate, again, under full ambient illumination. And this is illustrated by the bar graph on the right across all of the channels and uh, a, a, a snapshot of the uh, uh, well-plate experiment is shown to the right of that, just to give you a sense of how those measurements were acquired. And we're currently able, as I mentioned, to detect very uh, trace, trace amounts of fluorophores under full ambient illumination. Tissue penetration is an important requirement, uh, in, and we have tissue penetration capability that is sufficient to visualize subsurface signals. Um, the, the toughest spectral band here is uh, the 470 nanometer band because of the properties of biological tissue and we're able to penetrate a few millimeters of tissue in that band. And as you go deeper in the red and the near infrared, you're of course able to achieve deeper penetration. So as a couple of examples shown on the right hand side, we show you a simple experiment we've done with dead tissue and a couple of our agents, the IntegraSense agent on the 680 nanometer channel and the IntegraSense agent on the 750 nanometer channel and have placed these um, 
uh, agents in small phantoms within slices of that tissue at increasing depths, and as you can see, we're able to detect signal quite comfortably in the six to nine millimeter band. So certainly enough signal to go through folds of tissue uh, uh, as well as subcutaneous and surface detection. And broadly speaking, we've validated uh, the performance of the instrument under open air ambient lighting conditions under a wide range of ambient and surgical illumination. And to conclude this part of the presentation on the technology itself, I just wanted to mention that Solaris fits along a, a continuum of Perkin-Elmer offerings that go from the biochemical and cell assay uh, range with nucleic acid and protein detection to cellular imaging and detection to small animal imaging and tissue imaging, and now we've added large animal and translational imaging to that portfolio. And with that, what I'd like to do is hand it over to my colleague, Dr. Jeffrey Kiedersen, who will walk you through a number of key applications that his group has been able to develop. Okay, so now I'm going to share with you some of our Solaris application work that we've generated at Perkin Elmer's Research Center in Hopkinton, Massachusetts. As Dr. Yer described, uh, research on the Solaris requires pairing the imaging system and the fluorescence imaging agents. And together, they provide an important tool for studying a variety of disease processes and biological activities. Designed for large animal research, but also readily applicable to mouse and rat research. But all of our animal work, however, is performed as proof of concept for our ultimate goal of large animal translation. So some of the key applications that Dr. Yair went over uh, do include oncology, arthritis, atherosclerosis, and safety pharmacology. And we have a variety of near-infrared fluorescent imaging agents that detect different aspects of biological changes in the relevant animal models. I'll show you some of the data we've generated in oncology, uh, drug-induced liver injury and lymphatic draining generated in mice and rats. So I'm going to start by briefly introducing you to some of our imaging agents and the applications that have been developed over the years using small animal imaging systems like our IVA Spectrum CT and FMT4000. Then I'll move on to the application data with the Solaris. So first of all, to introduce you to these imaging agents, we have a variety of them that are readily applicable to cancer imaging, and these fall into uh, three, uh, three or four basic categories. So I'll start by describing the activatable agents, which are, as shown in the cartoon, optically silent in their native state. So when we inject these systemically into the animal, they circulate through the animal, they're going everywhere, and when they uh, go to the site of disease where you may have upregulated proteases, uh, the agent itself is cleaved, leading to a dequenching of the agent and a fluorescent on signal. And these agents include our matrix metalloprotease activatable agents, like our MMP sense uh, agents, our cathepsin family activatable agents uh, called ProSense, and we have some selective cathepsin activatable like CATK and CATB as well for uh, select applications. Uh, other uh, activatable agents like neutrophil elastase, renin activatable, and prostate specific antigen activatable agents as well to round out the portfolio. All of these quite useful for cancer uh, because many of these proteases are very important both in cancer itself as far as the uh, aggressiveness of cancer and encroaching into host tissue as well as being important in the inflammatory component of, uh, of, of cancer as well. Now we have also targeted agents that are relevant in cancer. These differ from the uh, activatable agents in that these agents are constitutively fluorescent. So we're waiting for them to bind to their target, uh, accumulate there, and then the unbound material will eventually wash away. So you image these a little bit differently, but there's a similar premise. And these include uh, agents that are ranging from very small molecule targeting moieties with a, a fluorophore label to larger molecules, so I'll, I'll go over in particular some data with our IntegraSense agent that was developed as a collaboration with Merck using a, a small molecule integrin antagonist. Uh, we also have other agents that pick up changes in bone like our OsteoSense uh, 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 cell death that occurs uh, in a variety of conditions with our Nex in vivo. We can do bacterial imaging and we can pick up other aspects of biology such as hypoxia in cancer with our hypoxy sense. Uh, we have a labeled trastuzumab, 
uh, also a collaboration with Roche that allows us to detect uh, HER2 new expression. And then we have some different agents like folate, R-Sense, bombesin R-Sense, and transferrin vivo that allow us to detect metabolic changes in, in cancer attributed to changes in expression levels of folate receptor, bombesin receptor, and transferrin receptor. Uh, the last category of imaging agents is our uh, physiologic agents, this is predominantly vascular agents that are, again, constitutively fluorescent, but they're not targeted, so they're going to flow where the blood flows. So they're going to accumulate at sites of vascular leak in cancer, for example, or at sites of edema associated with inflammation. And then uh, a, a final category would be our labels. So you can, if you have a uh, protein therapeutic of some sort or an antibody, uh, you can put a near-infrared label on those and uh, be able to track those in vivo as well, going to your sites of disease. We also have the capability of labeling cells with our VivoTrack uh, 680 agent. So many of these are also not just useful for cancer, but uh, can pick up inflammation, as I described. And we've also moved into doing basic pharmacology. You can do biodistribution and pharmacokinetics, as I described, with your own agents. And more recently, we've identified some of these imaging agents that are quite useful in picking up changes in tissues associated with uh, toxic insult by uh, uh, drugs, for example. So now here is kind of a, at least a snapshot of the world of applications that we've developed using our small animal uh, imaging boxes, our, our uh, IVA spectrum CT and FMT, for example. And these cover a whole variety of uh, different types of areas, in, and uh, including in cancer, here where we're using some of our agents to pick up metabolic changes, looking at treatment efficacy. We've been able to also multiplex some of our agents to see different types of biological changes in cancer simultaneously. We've been able to look at pharmacokinetics by non-invasive imaging of the heart, uh, whole body biodistribution studies, pulmonary inflammation, arthritis, toxicology, and even into CNS demyelination as well. We also have tools in bioluminescence that we're not going to talk about today that uh, give us uh, the ability to take bioluminescent cancer in our small animal models and quantify changes in, in growth or response to therapy. So some of these agents have been identified for us to focus on for our Solaris work, and these include uh, some of the agents listed here. Uh, and these include our Angiosense 680EX agent, which is great for looking at tumor vascular leak and inflammatory edema, as I described earlier. And we've also found it quite useful for looking at uh, uh, lymphatic drainage. Uh, we've looked at sort of experimental models of lymphatic drainage and, and going to lymph nodes, identifying lymph nodes. Uh, we're also working on the same application in cancer, and I'll show you some of the data we've generated to date. Our MMP and uh, Cathepsin activatable agents, MMP Sense and ProSense, quite useful in cancer again. Our IntegraSense, very good for detecting alpha V beta 3 integrin expression. And our folate agent for detecting metabolic changes associated with folate uptake. Now, a lot of the work we've done that I'm really not going to share with you today has been geared towards identifying uh, the right doses for imaging on the Solaris imaging system. We know, for example, in the mouse that we need 80 uh, uh, nanomoles per kilogram body weight in order to effectively non-invasively image through the animal, whether by tomography or doing superficial 2D imaging. When we start extrapolating to larger animals and in the context of doing uh, surgical imaging on the Solaris imaging system, we now uh, have realized that we can drop that dose a little bit on a per kilogram amount down to 24 nanomoles per kilogram. So that keeps some of the, the doses down to a, a reasonable level. And we've characterized this uh, uh, both ourselves to some degree and through collaborations. So now I'm going to give you a little bit of a snapshot of one of the agents. I'm not going to go through all of them today, but this one I'll talk about to a fair degree with some of our imaging data sets. Uh, it's our IntegraSense imaging agent. I mentioned this as an agent we developed in collaboration with Merck. It's designed from a small molecule integrin antagonist that Merck developed. And we worked for about a year and a half in developing the uh, 
uh, ability to identify a, a conjugation site and an link, appropriate linker for us to put a fluorophore that allows this to function uh, as a, uh, an imaging agent for cancer and certain types of inflammation. So uh, alpha V-beta-3 integrin is upregulated in a whole variety of cancers. Many of them, there are some in which it does not, but most cancers we find quite good for uh, alpha V-beta-3 upregulation. And we can see it expressed both in the tumors as well as in vessels that are uh, newly formed. Uh, and it's also expressed in certain types of macrophage inflammation. So what we've seen at the application level is it's quite useful for both oncology applications as well as atherosclerosis. And there are a few other applications as well, for example, in osteoclast uh, uh, imaging as well. One of the nice things about this agent is, although it's a small molecule agent, it is uh, internalized into cells through receptor-mediated endocytosis. And it allows us to have a good imaging window uh, for uh, labeling those cells in vivo. They uptake it and hold on to this agent for quite a while. So now just a little bit of a description on uh, tumor biology. Obviously, the, uh, what's happening in tumors is quite complex. There's a lot of different biological activities from the obvious uh, metabolism and proliferation of, of tumor cells to uh, spontaneous apoptosis and necrosis that can occur in a growing cancer, as well as when you're uh, treating with certain therapeutics will obviously enhance the uh, cellular death and and necrosis that occurs in tissue. There's hypoxia. There's vascular leak associated with the angiogenesis that occurs in tumors. And of course, there's a lot of inflammation that goes on and a lot of proteases that are produced by these inflammatory cells as well as by the tumor cells. Uh, and even within the blood vessels, there are markers that we can go after that allow us to see these. So as an example, you know, one of the things we can look at in a molecular imaging context is vascular leak with an agent like angiosense that sees certain regions of the tumor, uh, often broadly spread through the tumor, a vascular leak associated with the angiogenesis that's occurring there. And we've been able to successfully use this agent to detect not only the vascular leak, but a response to anti uh, uh, with anti-angiogenic therapies. Now, most relevant, I think, for the Solaris imaging system, where our goal is really to have a tool for being able to very effectively visualize the tumors and identify the tumor margins. So one of the best ways to do that is to have agents that label the entire tumor quite well. And a couple of these agents that we've really focused on include our ProSense agents that see predominantly cathepsin B, although a family of cathepsins, that generally are distributed throughout the tumor and within the inflammatory cells uh, throughout the tumor. Integrasense, in, in a similar manner, sees alpha V beta 3 integrin expression on uh, tumors throughout uh, uh, the tumor cells throughout the tumor. So it gives you a great way of not only seeing the primary tumor, but also tumor mets that may be either proximal or distal to the primary tumor mass. So now on to the Solaris imaging system. You've seen a few images already. I wanted to give you a sense of uh, uh, the system at work. So you can see here uh, someone on the, the left image uh, focusing on an animal in the uh, uh, surgical site. You can see it's very brightly illuminated. As a matter of fact, it's very, easy, very difficult to take good pictures of uh, the system at work because the light is so bright at the surgical site that it's very hard to actually see the animal from a distance. And you can see that at the bottom right here, how bright that light is on the animal. Uh, yet, if we allow uh, a shorter um, exposure time, you can see the rat uh, quite readily. It makes the room look very dark. And in the upper right, you can see what it looks like uh, when you have the animal very heavily illuminated with the white light. But yet, you can see on the computer monitor you're quite easily able to see the fluorescent signal in the animal that's being visualized. So under the bright surgical lights, we're able to do real-time acquisition of live fluorescent signal occurring within the animal, oftentimes non-invasively. We can see a certain depth into the animal. Uh, the other thing that we can do, and we're finding this quite useful, is rapid screening of hand-restrained animals, even without anesthesia, obviously likely more small animal work. Uh, and this is quite helpful, we're finding, for just rapidly screening through animals that we want to triage for going into our small animal imaging systems. So just a, <clears throat> a couple of things that we've worked out is just to e exemplify how the system works. 
obviously not only are the surgical lights on, but we have uh, lights on in the room as well. And it doesn't affect the system at all. You can see in the upper panels here that even with all the room lights on, the uh, fluorescent signal with our Integrasense 750 here lighting up a tumor on the flank of this mouse lights it up quite well. And you can see there is some general bodily signal attributed to the agent circulating through all the tissues of the body. But you see very nice accumulation that the system can detect quite readily in that flank site, uh, even in the presence of all the room lights. When the room lights are off, uh, you really can't tell that it's any different at all. So now an example of a, a real-life uh, utility for this system. Uh, we've done a lot of work in rats as a proof of concept for moving on to larger animals. Obviously, a rat is not that large, but large enough for it to get us to get some of these concepts in performing uh, surgical intervention, resection of tumors, etc. Uh, so what I've done here is show a study that we did with peritoneally implanted HCT116 uh, tumor cells uh, that were tending to grow in a very local site, very close to the spleen and relatively close to the surface of the animal. So when we go in, we can acquire video of our entire um, uh, surgical procedure. I just uh, grab some snapshots from the real-time video acquisition. So you can see here in the upper left, this is just the non-invasive imaging. We applied a little bit of thresholding to remove some of that background uh, type signal that you saw in the last image. And you can see a very nicely defined region that we attribute to the tumor that's growing just in the peritoneum near the spleen. We can then drape the animal for surgery here, and you can still see that tumor. We've, we've washed the uh, surgical site. We then progress to performing the uh, incision in the animal to expose the tumor. And on the far right, you see the animal completely open. We remove the tumor. You can see that signal quite nicely as the tumor is removed. And we can examine the surgical site and ascertain whether there's any additional tumor mass there and the video goes on to pulling the spleen out and exposing it fully to make sure there's no uh, masses growing within the spleen, and we can close the animal back up and, and uh, uh, look at that animal at later time points by re-injecting with IntegraSense a couple weeks later uh, or a couple months later even. So we do see a depth-dependent capability for our non-invasive detection. Certainly if it's much deeper, it can be more challenging, but we do see uh, relatively well uh, into the animal. And with proper background thresholding, we can see uh, uh, really very nicely. We can apply some quantitative tools to this as well uh, by placing ROIs either in real time or uh, on the snapshots that we acquire. Here just shows an example of comparing the signal non-invasively and uh, after excising the tumor as compared to a relevant control site either on the flank of the animal or within the surgical site. And we're seeing in this particular model with a, with a fairly small tumor that was near the spleen, about a 1.7 fold signal to noise ratio. So now we've moved on also to other types of surgical models in which we wanted to assess the capability of identifying tumors and defining the, the tumor margins, as well as following up these animals to see if we were able to get all of that uh, tumor mass and remove it. And to do that, we did a study where we implanted subcutaneous HT29 uh, tumor cells into nude rats, and we performed survival surgery. And here you can see a sequence of images from preoperative imaging, uh, both in white light and fluorescence. And you can see there's a tumor mass below uh, the skin surface. Uh, we can expose the tumor and see it readily. We can remove the tumor surgically. We can then um, uh, examine the site where the tumor was and close it up, and we can see that there's no residual signal uh, left within that tumor site. As a control, we could take another animal where we did an incomplete tumor resection to see what that would look like, where we did the same sequence of, of events, the preoperative imaging, exposing the tumor, removing the tumor, only in this case, we removed only part of the tumor and left a little bit of the tumor mass approximately a fifth of the tumor left. And you can see that it's that residual tumor is still there, and even after we close the animals, we can see a little bit of an indication that there's some residual tumor mass remaining. 
just another example here, looking at, at uh, full depth of, of imaging in an animal. We did this by necropsy in the rat, just so we could open the animal wide and really look around for different tumor masses. So again, we can start from the pre-op where you can see some indication that there are some deep tissue masses. When we remove the skin, we can see a little bit deeper into the animal. We can identify some additional uh, masses that are there. Once we completely expose the cavity, we start seeing some, uh, some higher resolution as we pull back the peritoneal lining. We can see some masses that were attached to the peritoneal lining. We can see some very small nodules as well uh, within the site. When we remove all of those, we can still see a small uh, uh, net still remaining that we could then remove in the sequence of events. And one thing I'd like to point out when we do this, this type of imaging and trying to identify both primary masses and nets, it is important which agent you select. Here's an example where when we use our bombesin receptor detecting agent, we had a lot of interference from the intestinal uh, region because that's a known site of bombesin receptor upregulation. When we switch to ProSense 750 FAST, detecting cathepsin activity in the tumors, we see nice signal in the tumor masses and very little signal uh, remaining in the, in the intestines. So now I'm going to briefly go over a couple of uh, quick applications, one in lymph node draining and the other in acute drug-induced liver injury. So here, here is a, a sequence of captured uh, uh, stills from a video that was acquired where we injected angiosense 680EX into the tail base and watch it moving up the lymphatics into the first the inguinal lymph node and then uh, progressing up into the axial lymph node. And you can see really quite well, uh, very well-defined lymphatics. And in the video, you can actually see the pulsing of these lymphatics as discrete um, you know, masses of fluorescence are propagated along the lymphatics and into the lymph nodes. And of course, importantly, when we place uh, point ROIs on those uh, lymph node sites, we can actually quantify this both in real time as we're acquiring the videos, but also in snapshots that we can uh, collect as well. And you can quantify that there's a rapid progression of increase of signal in the inguinal lymph node that peaks at about um, uh, three minutes uh, and then uh, starts declining as it's moving out of that lymph node and some of that material is propagating onto the axial lymph node. The axial lymph node shown in yellow below is peaking at about five minutes, two minutes later. And it doesn't look as bright, but also that's because the axial node is a little bit deeper in the tissue. It's under the arm web of the animal. So uh, you're clearly able to see the differential kinetics uh, uh, going into these two different lymph nodes. The obvious application of this is being able to, to both identify and quantify uh, lymph node drainage to nearby nodes. Here's another example of lymphatic draining here injecting into a different site just to show you that uh, you can get a different pattern of, of lymphatic draining. So when we inject a foot pad here, we see uh, progression and drainage into first the popliteal lymph node and then eventually into the uh, lumbar node. And we can also quantify that over time. We can use this as a tool for identifying those nodes and we can intervene surgically and go in and actually expose these nodes um, surgically and then remove them as well. So the last application I want to quickly show is some of our early safety pharmacology work. We've done a lot of work in this area in developing uh, imaging agents and techniques for detecting uh, liver tox uh, caused by a variety of different uh, drugs. It's very important for pharmaceutical companies to be able to screen small molecule drugs for their potential for toxicity. And we've developed an imaging cocktail that's composed of uh, three different near-infrared fluorescent imaging agents that allow us to see multiple different types of liver tox. There are different forms of it, hepatocellular cholestasis, which is a bile duct blockage, and fatty liver uh, side effects of drugs that's called steatosis. So with our cocktail of agents, we're able to see multiple of these different types of uh, mechanisms. And that's exemplified here by some data we generated with a drug called thioacetamide. We use 350 milligrams per kilogram of PAA given twice over a period of eight hours. We injected the imaging cocktail 24 hours after the first injection and imaged 24 hours thereafter. 
So first you can see what the unthresholded data looks like, where you can see a clear difference between the control and the TAA injected. But once we apply some modest thresholding based on the point ROI we placed just outside of the uh, imaging field, uh, or the, the liver uh, region, uh, we use that to apply thresholding, and you can very nicely see the liver signal even non-invasively. When we remove the skin, we can see that signal even better and how well-defined it is uh, localizing to the liver. And then with a full exposure of the liver, you can see that quite readily as well. And when we apply quantification to this, we can see that even in the intact animal, uh, uh, even though the, the liver is a big organ and fairly deep in the animal, enough of it is superficial, relatively close to the skin, that we can see a good differential between the liver and background sites. As you remove the skin, obviously, you're going to get a lot better uh, differential and better signal within that liver. And, of course, the ultimate ideal for the Solaris is when you fully open the animal, you get a very nice dynamic range of detection of that. The ultimate application of this is not just to focus on uh, liver tox, but to use these, this uh, cocktail of agents to do uh, a necropsy of the animals and to look at all of the uh, different organ systems and to identify whether there are any red flags in different organ systems that may be being affected by your um, acute treatment with your drug. So with that, I'd like to end by summarizing some of the work uh, that we've done with our Solaris imaging system. It's allowed us to visualize fluorescent signal in, uh, uh, in our, a number of our small animals, and we have collaborators working on larger animals, which is the ultimate application. It offers a bright imaging field with ambient light rejection, multiple channels of imaging, uh, proprietary spectral unmixing technology that allows us to better look at some of those uh, 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 more visible fluorescent uh, channels has a very simple user interface with real-time quantification capabilities that allows us to, on the fly, see what's happening in different sites of the body as we're acquiring our videos. Uh, has a utility in oncology and multiple other research areas, including atherosclerosis, arthritis, vaccine de development, and safety pharmacology, as we've discussed. And just has a very easy uh, interface, real-time videos and snapshots to acquire video and snapshot analysis tools. Our in-house validation studies, as I've described, have focused predominantly on mouse and rat. However, several prototypes are currently in use for the ultimate application in large animal uh, uh, imaging. So with that, I'd like to open up to uh, any of the questions that you may have submitted. Excellent presentation, Dr. Yared and Dr. Peterson. Thank you for bringing that information to us. Before we get started with audience questions, here's a quick reminder about how to reach us today. Questions can be sent via the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window, and we'll get to as many as we can. And our first question comes from David at the University of Oxford. What about autofluorescence at longer wavelengths, i.e. 600 nm? Autofluorescence signal is quite large there, too. Yes, so I can address that uh, question. That's a, that's a very good question. We thought uh, quite, uh, quite long about the spectral coverage of the instrument and where we wanted to introduce autofluorescence removal technology. And our assessment was that, of course, this would be most pertinent at the 470 nanometer channel for FITSI. Um, the audience member is correct. There is indeed autofluorescence around 600 nanometer as well. It is much lower than at 470, but it's still present nonetheless. However, our uh, next channel up has an excitation wavelength of 660 nanometers. Uh, it is targeted at dyes that have a peak absorption wavelength, uh, wavelength of 680 nanometers with an emission that peaks at 700 to 705 nanometers. And at that uh, emission wavelength, the autofluorescence is sufficiently attenuated that we felt it wasn't um, uh, beneficial to introduce the complexity of spectral deconvolution on that band. Then, of course, on the 750 and 800 bands, it is much lower. So we feel on balance that we've optimized the uh, optical performance of the system to, prov to provide maximal benefit. Great. Thank you. Our next question comes from Mohammed at Barrow Neurological Institute. 
Is it possible to illuminate in different wavelengths simultaneously? So um, to be clear, it is possible to co-inject multiple agents on multiple wavelengths into the same animal at the same time. The imaging itself is conducted one channel at a time, but then the images can be overlaid across multiple channels. So we can conduct a multi-channel experiment, but the imaging itself is conducted one channel at a time. Great. Thank you. Our next question from uh, Xuan at Merck. For the lymph node draining studies, how much dye was injected at the tail base? Yeah, typically we inject in the range of about uh, five nanomoles per injection site. Now, when you start applying that to uh, tumor uh, lymphatic draining, you would spread that same five nanomoles over multiple sites of injection within the tumor, and we try to keep the volumes fairly low, uh, and you know, and that tends to work quite well. Going up much higher gives you a very high signal that can be often difficult to deal with because you really have to amplify the signal to see the smaller amounts, obviously, that are leaking out. Uh, the doses that we're using are compatible with what people have done with ICG, for example, but uh, we're putting some data together that uh, um, you know, it does provide some sort of side-by-side -side with some of the variety of agents we've looked at, and I, I think we're finding we may even be able to go a little bit lower. Thank you. Our next question from Olga at Cytomex Therapeutics. Would this system, Solaris, be applicable to clinic in the future? Are you expecting any limitations or adjustments? Yeah, so uh, to be clear, for now we are uh, releasing this instrument commercially for research use only. Uh, so we're not uh, dedicating, dedicating it to the clinic. It is possible as we study the, the space of applications and demand that we might uh, in the future engineer a version of the Solaris instrument for clinical use. Generally speaking, uh, clinical imaging devices are, a, are simpler and require only a subset of the features that research instruments or preclinical instruments have. So it would be a simplification of the existing architecture, but for now, the Solaris instrument is for research use only. Thank you. Next up, from James at Sanofi Genzyme. Have you tried newly discovered brain lymphatic channels? No, we haven't really um, um, done any work in that area today. We've, we've been focusing mostly on identifying and optimizing the uh, right agents for most effectively uh, defining the lymphatics, and we have been uh, quite surprised to see just how uh, variable it can be and how much the uh, physical chemical properties of the agent you inject can affect just how well and effectively you can um, image the lymphatics. For example, designing those or selecting those that allow not only detection of the, the lymph nodes, but not allowing too much leakage out of those nodes. A lot of them we find are giving a halo effect around the nodes. So most of our work's been there, but we'll be advancing into further applications as we move on. Great. We have another question from Jack at UT Health. Is there any influence when the surgical light is on? Typically, the surgical light is relatively strong, even at NIR. Yes, uh, thank you. The, the, uh, the surgical lights uh, do have an influence on uh, so, some modes of, of the instrument, but generally speaking, uh, as, as some of Dr. Peterson's imagery has, uh, has demonstrated, we can acquire images with the lights both on and off with equal ease and no effect on the quantification. Great. Our next question from James. Have you tried liver toxin at, excuse me, wow. question. Have you tried liver toxin? Yeah, we have really focused on, on um, drug-induced liver injury, but many of the uh, same mechanisms that are involved in responding to toxic drugs are going to be similar or 
are many of them applicable to other types of liver injury, including infectious disease and toxins and this type of thing. But no, we haven't yet worked in that area at all. Great. I think our next question we have uh, comes in from One moment. Comes in from Justin. Is such a prototype available in Europe for trials? Um, we currently have an early access instrument in Europe, uh, but uh, the instrument will be uh, more broadly available in late summer this year uh, worldwide. So that does include Europe, yes. Great. We have another question. You have four channels, but only show images of the signals at depth on the 660 and 750 channels. Do you expect the same performance at depth for the 470 channel with FITC and the 800 channel with ICG? Right. So uh, generally, tissue penetration improves as you go into the near infrared. So uh, we expect shallower penetration in the FITSI or, or uh, fluorescein channel at 470 nanometers, uh, improved tissue penetration at 650 nanometers, and better penetration at 750 and 800 nanometers. So I would expect the ICG channel to be similar to the 750 channel in terms of uh, tissue penetration and depth of detection, and the 470 channel to be more superficial than, than the others. Great. Another question. Will other methods of agent delivery, IP or spray-on, work with this system? Yes, we have explored that. In particular, the uh, uh, spray-on approach can work quite well. You have other issues of, you know, what particularly you're spraying on, how you're washing it away, because obviously if you generate a lot of signal on the surface of the animal, uh, that can be issues. Um, IP is more of a, a, a question of the pharmacology. A lot of uh, the targeted agents that we use would not fare very well by IP unless you're imaging something distal from the IP space because you create a lot of uh, signal just localized in the IP space. So barring any sort of technical issues that have little to do with the Solaris, uh, yeah, absolutely. You should be able to go with any injection route that is appropriate for the agent that you're looking at, and for the site that you're imaging. Thank you. Our next question from Philippe at ILC. What is the maximum depth and the largest animal that has been imaged in a Solaris? Yeah, I think on the on the imaging size, anything that can be placed on a surgical bed uh, can be imaged on the Solaris. The imaging field of view is 10 by 10 centimeters, and, and the, the optical head can be moved pretty readily on an articulated arm. In terms of the penetration depth, that's uh, a question that really depends on the floor for the floor for brightness, and the concentration. And so um, it's, it's not a, a, the type of question that is based on the instrument design alone. So it's a combination of the instrument Along, alongside the agent and the agent delivery, uh, and to a lesser extent, which organ you're actually imaging. What we're comfortable with is our ability to detect fluorescence emanating from deep-seated lesions that are a few millimeters in depth, certainly in the red and the infrared channel, but that's really working with some of the agents that, that we've mentioned, such as Androsense, Integrosense, Prosense, and others. Um, and we'd be happy to look at some other agents based on the utility and the the, uh, the type of um, the type of application that is uh, that is of interest. Thank you very much. That is all the time we have for questions today. If we didn't get to yours, we will definitely follow you, follow up with you via email. I would like to thank our speakers, Dr. Y.L. Uret and Dr. Jeffrey Peterson today, as well as our sponsor, Perkin Elmer for making it possible to bring this presentation to you. Today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through December 24, 2015. 
and you'll receive an email from Labroots alerting you when it's available on demand and posted on Labroots.com. You are welcome to forward this announcement to any colleagues who weren't able to join in today. Thank you for logging on and participating in today's broadcast. See you next time.